In this Q&A video, we're going to answer the question, what are my responsibilities under law for emergency lighting? Now, just before we explain the answers to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of emergency lighting in association with Robus. They can be viewed individually, or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD, and you'll receive a certificate to prove that you've completed the course. Emergency lighting and the law make for quite odd bedfellows. Up until 2005, there were various mandatory statutory instruments or sets of laws relating to fire prevention and emergency lighting, including the Fire Certificate Special Premises Regulations 1976, the Fire Precautions Workplace Regulations 1997, the Fire Precautions Workplace Amendment Regulations of 1999, and many more. Then, in 2005, these were all revoked along with around 100 other pieces of legislation that were either revoked or amended by a new statutory instrument called the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order of 2005. This changed the focus of slavishly following a fixed set of rules for fire safety and emergency lighting and instead applied a general duty to those in control of a premises. This general duty requires that the designer and the responsible persons demonstrate to relevant authorities that necessary precautions, including adequate emergency lighting, are in place to ensure the safety of occupants and visitors in a building. A critical part of this process is for the responsible person to carry out a fire risk assessment and based on that risk assessment, produce a policy document covering fire safety. This will include emergency lighting. This risk assessment and policy document should demonstrate to the relevant authorities that the emergency lighting and other precautions will provide sufficient protection to the occupants and visitors. These other precautions will include things like staff training, escape procedures, well-prepared and maintained escape routes, incorporating relevant escape signs, escape notices and fire detection and alarm systems, and firefighting equipment. The Industry Committee for Emergency Lighting, a division of the Lighting Industry Association, has published a helpful technical statement on fire risk assessments showing how important it is that there is clear communication, collaboration and input between the risk assessor and other contributing parties, like the duty holder of the premises, suppliers of fire protection systems, insurers and, of course, legislative requirements. Now, speaking of legislative requirements, interestingly, the fire safety order meant that BS 5266 was no longer a rigid document that had to be followed in order for a fire certificate to be issued. So, do you need to comply with it? Well, the documentation and regulation of emergency lighting follows the so-called hierarchy of statutory provision, which basically means that the statutory document, in this case, the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order of 2005, lays down the law, but it doesn't contain detailed guidance on how to install the emergency lighting so that it complies. That falls to additional supporting and non-statutory documents, including BS 5266-1, which is the code of practice for the emergency lighting of premises. And then guidance to this code of practice can be found in the Electrician's Guide to Emergency Lighting published by the IET, where you'll find information on how to design, install, and maintain emergency lighting systems. There's lots of useful information in here, including lighting levels for escape routes, anti-panic lighting for open areas, and the reason you may have to put two emergency light fittings into a relatively small room to allow for the failure of a lamp. While these documents, including BS 5266, may not be statutory in themselves, compliance with them will help you to comply with the law. Now, we've mentioned the term responsible person a couple of times in this video, but what does it actually mean? Well, in the context of fire safety and emergency lighting, we can find a definition of it in the lighting handbook published by the Society of Light and Lighting. In the glossary, we find it defined as a delegated individual who is responsible for the provision and operation of appropriate emergency escape lighting. So this person will be someone who is connected to the management of the building and is assigned to make sure that the emergency lighting is doing its job. But their duties include other things as well. For instance, in Regulation 14 of the Fire Safety Order of 2005, you also find this direction. Where necessary, in order to safeguard the safety of relevant persons, the responsible person must ensure that routes to emergency exits from premises and the exits themselves are kept clear at all times. So the responsible person in the light of the fire safety order looks after far more than just the emergency lighting, but also practical things like making sure no one is piling boxes up in the escape routes or locking or blocking emergency exits, along with other responsibilities. But is someone working in a building and acting as a responsible person going to have the necessary skills to be, as the SLL handbook says, responsible for the provision and operation of appropriate emergency escape lighting? Well, maybe, maybe not. 
But the role of responsible person isn't about doing all the work yourself. It is possible to delegate work to others with skills that you don't have. Being responsible sometimes means knowing what you don't know and making sure you bring in someone who can fill that skill or knowledge gap. For that reason, you'll also come across the term competent person. So what's a competent person? Well, again, if we turn to the glossary of the SLL Lighting Handbook, we can find a definition. It reads, person with the relevant current training and experience and with access to the requisite tools, equipment and information and capable of carrying out a defined task. Now, it is possible that the responsible person may meet those requirements of being up to date with relevant training and experience along with all the other things mentioned there. So the responsible person and the competent person may be the same person. For example, the responsible person carrying out the fire risk assessment must have the competence to do so. Or it may simply be that the responsible person delegates certain tasks they know are outside their wheelhouse. So what sort of jobs in connection with emergency lighting would require the services of a competent person? Well, we've mentioned the risk assessment, but there's other things mentioned in the Electrician's Guide to Emergency Lighting as well. One such area is design. This is arguably the most important stage of the life of emergency lighting. However, it's easily overlooked or have rules of thumb applied to it from various publications. However, these often will give you an idea of where lights should be installed, but don't mention how many lumens the fittings are required to output to achieve this. The really tricky areas are staircases. Designing these to make sure that you meet the requirements of at least one lux on each tread requires careful design and calculation. This can be quite labor intensive and require meticulous attention to detail. But the good news is that this is one of those areas that can be delegated to competent people elsewhere. The lighting design team at Robus are ready and waiting to carry out your emergency lighting design and they will take responsibility as the competent people for that aspect of your installation. What a huge weight off your mind that is. Another example of a task for a competent person is that there is a requirement to produce as installed drawings of the emergency lighting system and the guide states that the drawings shall be signed by a competent person to verify that they are as installed and that the design meets the requirements of BS 5266-1. Also, that a competent person will oversee the handover process to the building maintenance staff, including providing training, relevant documentation, and highlighting the critical nature of maintaining the emergency lighting logbook. Of course, signing the as-fitted drawings and carrying out the handover would be the job of the installer as the competent person in these cases, rather than the emergency lighting designer from Robus if you've used that service from them. Competent persons are also required for servicing and inspecting and testing the system. So there we go, that's some of the legal responsibilities put upon the responsible person and the competent persons too. But you may be wondering, just how is the inspection and testing of an emergency lighting system carried out? Well, to find out more about that, check out this video right here, or click the link in the description below to watch it as part of our free training package to help you with your CPD, and you'll receive a certificate as well. For further information on emergency lighting from Robus, check out their latest catalogue, or get in touch with them via email on info at All that remains in this video is to say, thank you very much for watching.